Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Matthew chapter 24, and we are leading up to the condition of mankind, the events of the world that will eventually lead to the abomination of desolation. Remember sort of what we said last time, that finally man became so evil that God saw that they were unredeemable and he had already selected a date in which he was going to open up the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven were going to open up and he was going to pour down water upon the earth and kill everything because they were unredeemable. All flesh had corrupted his way. Well, when it comes to the abomination of desolation, I believe that that's what will happen with mankind himself is that man will become so corrupt, so vile, so decrepit and abominable in his mind, in his heart, in his imaginations, that it will get past the point where man is redeemable and God has no choice but to turn mankind over to be ruled over by the man of sin, which I think has something to do with the abomination of desolation. Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to start, verse 12. And he said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And again, I'm going to say that it's a million and a half different views and understandings and interpretations of what the abomination of desolation is. I sort of have my own. But remember, it comes from the book of Daniel, which, according to the book of Daniel itself, is a sealed book. Whereas you have Daniel, the 27th book of the Old Testament. You have Revelation, 27th book of the New Testament. Daniel is sealed. Revelation is unsealed. Just like the, the book in Jeremiah 32, which is the 777th chapter of the Bible. I like that where um, Jeremiah buys a parcel of land from Hanamiel, his uncle's son, his cousin. He has a right to redeem it. And they write out the, the land references. In other words, it's sort of like a, uh, a title deed to the land and where all the landmarks are and how much land it is. And there's a copy that's sealed and a copy that's open. And the sealed copy is to remain that way until such a day as it's time for them to receive that land back, then it would be unsealed again. So I believe that a lot of the things in the book of Daniel, if anybody says, oh, I've got a complete understanding of the book of Daniel, I don't believe them. Because I think the understanding of what Daniel is referring to is still sealed up and will not be unsealed until Revelation 5, Revelation 6, Revelation 7, and so on, when Jesus begins to unseal the book. But anyway, back to what, what brings about the abomination of desolation. He says, iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I mentioned last week that that reminded me of several things. Number one, the book of Genesis, where God saw that the wicked, wickedness of man was so great that he was unredeemable. He got to a point where God said, I can't save anybody. They're, all they think about is sin, 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 sin. They don't think about wanting salvation, so I have to destroy them all. And then I thought about the prophecies that both Peter and Jude made concerning what was going to happen in the last days, concerning the false teachers, 
the false prophets, the false preachers, and all the false brethren who follow their pernicious ways. Let's look at Jude and see what he has to say about the condition of mankind and what happens to man when he starts believing all of these false teachings. Jude chapter, of course there's only one chapter in Jude, so we look at verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but, th but what they know naturally as brute beasts. And I have that underlined for a reason. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Th these are spots in your feast of charity, and when they feast with you, feeding with themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but if you remember, Jude says here that they're the, the false teachers, the false prophets, the false believers, the false Christians, the false churches, false denominations, you name it. He says that they're raging waves of the sea. When John saw the beast for the very first time, where did he see him come from? Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So I think that it's possible that the coming of the Antichrist comes about as a result of all of the false teaching, false preaching, false doctrine, false Bibles, false brethren, false churches, false denominations, to where they finally become so corrupt that they bring about a point in Earth's history where now the earth is ready to receive the most evil, brutal king to ever rule over anybody on the earth, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, another Jesus, the beast, 666. So I think these raging waves of the sea have a lot to do with why the beast comes up out of the sea. So that's what Jude said here. He mentioned brute beasts and he, and he mentions three people. He mentions Cain, he mentions Balaam, and he mentions Korah as examples of what this man of sin, the son of perdition, who brings about the abomination of desolation what he's like, and all three of these particular characters, whether it was Cain or Balaam or Korah, who was Moses' first cousin, there's certain traits about them that are in this man of sin, the son of perdition, who brings about the abomination of desolation. First, we look at Cain, and this is real simple. Cain was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, and Eve said, I've got a man from the Lord. She had high hopes that this man was going to be a godly man because God gave her a son and she thought, wow, he's really going to serve God. But if you remember, God hated him. God despised his sacrifices, wouldn't accept any of them, while he did accept Abel's sacrifices, the second born son. Why was that? First John chapter 3 tells us that not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Now, there's a theory floating around out there. And because of social media, it's gained a lot of traction with a lot of people that seem to believe that Satan 
in his conversation in Genesis 3 with Eve that he actually um, fornicated with her or raped her or talked her into procreating with her somehow, some way. And that's where Cain came from. And then, of course, people use that for a lot of reasons, like, well, that's where all the black people came from. Or, that's where all these people who pretend they're Jews, whose names are Cohen and Levi and Weinstein and all of this stuff, that's where they came. So, in other words, anybody you don't like, as a racist, you can say that they are the seed of Satan through Eve because obviously Satan copulated with Eve and produced all of these mongrel type people and it gives you justification to hate their guts. Nah. That's just racism, pure and simple. It's what it is. Okay? When it says, who is of that wicked one? Um, do you know who the children of Belial are? Do you know who the children of the wicked one are? Do you know who the generation of vipers are? Do you know who the, the basically the offspring, the seed of Satan, do you know who they are? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, he's given the parable of the wheat and the tares. And... Um, when he gives the explanation of it, he says in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, you know who that is? Everybody that's lost. Everybody in the whole world that is lost and has not been born again. In other words, when I was born in this world, I was automatically a child of the devil. I had been born once. There was no redemption of my flesh. My flesh was bound for hell automatically. And I was a child of that wicked one. But because of the second birth, God has redeemed me and now I'm a child of my heavenly father. But getting back to Cain, Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So Jude is sort of contrasting the two types of people that are in this world. There are those people who have determined that they're going to live for God. They're going to do what's right. They're going to do the best they can, understanding that nobody is sin free and they're going to rely upon the grace of God and belief in his name and trust in his word. And they are born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Whereas everybody else in the world is a child of the devil, children of Belial, seed of the serpent, ye generation of vipers. They are like Cain who was of that wicked one because his works were evil. So that's one thing that Jude remarks about the false teachers and the false prophets is that basically they're unredeemable because they're like Cain, they're of that wicked one. Well, then he mentions Balaam. And we know the story of Balaam, right? Where Balaam was riding on his donkey and his donkey kept stopping and Balaam started beating him with his stick and finally the, the donkey said, why are you beating me? There's an angel of the Lord standing there with a sword drawn. I'm not going to go past him. And Balaam then gets into an argument with his donkey. Now, to me, that just like blows my mind because I'm like, your donkey's talking to you and yet you're not going, my donkey's talking to me. You're arguing with your donkey. I mean, I just don't get that. But let's, let's read it. Numbers 22:18. 18. 
Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Do you know what Balaam was really doing here? Now, it, it looks like he was acting spiritual, like I cannot tell you anything other than what God tells me. Even if you offered me your house full of silver and gold, wink, wink, wink. And see, now we know Balaam then was lying through his teeth about sticking with the word of God. What he was doing was naming his price. In other words, King Balak, I'll take your house full of silver and gold. And then I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. But I will say, this is thus saith the Lord. Numbers chapter 22, verse 32. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. You see, Jude's describing false prophets, false teachers, and false brethren. And he's using three people in the Bible as his illustration. Cain, the first one, who all of his deeds are evil. There is no righteousness in him whatsoever. And it really describes, believe it or not, the majority of the 21st century church. Most church people in this country, most church members in this country, don't do anything good at all. Their life is full of sin. They have liquor cabinets, refrigerators full of beer, their computers full of porn, they steal from work. They cheat on their husbands. They cheat on their wives. They're doing all kinds of sin, and yet they go down to Grace Point Community Church and sit in with five to 7,000 people. Woo, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And they hear a, a positive message. It has no negative things in it whatsoever and believe that God wants to make them healthy and rich all the time. Then you have the group like Balaam, that I will say things that will keep the money coming in. But don't ask me to say anything that might rub people the wrong way or that might offend them because then the money won't come in. They're the hireling shepherds that Jesus referred to. And they're in the pulpits and they're in the pews as well. You see, some people... Pick churches where they can make business contacts or churches where they can cheat in their business and make a ton of money, but their preacher's not going to point out their sin because they're going to be the, their preacher's going to be the recipients of what's got to be a huge amount of tithe money. You see how it works? This is all building up to the abomination of desolation. It, it is the cumulative sin of mankind growing and festering and becoming. It's like, a, it's like a boil you get. It starts out real small, but the longer you let it go, the bigger it gets. And the more it hurts, the more it's inflamed, and the more of that white junk that's in it builds up in there. Then he mentions Korah. Korah, if you, look at the, if you look at the genealogy, Korah's dad and Moses' dad were brothers, meaning that Korah and Moses were first cousins. And look what happened with Korah. Number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, 
And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now look at what, look at what Korah is saying. Korah is, you have two types of preachers. You have Moses and Korah. Moses is the kind of preacher who has been given God's law and says, you're all sinners and God is going to judge your sin with death. If you don't change your ways, God is going to judge your sin. And that's Moses. Then you got Korah, who represents the new 21st century church that says, these people, are they're all holy people. God, even though they're two men living together, God made them that way, and what they're doing is holy before God. You've got men and women shacking up, that's what we used to call it, living in sin, living in fornication, without the benefit of marriage, living together, attending having positions in the churches. There's a church in this county where the song leader, the choir director, his wife left him because he preferred men, but they remain friends, so he comes with his boyfriend, she comes to church with her boyfriend. Can't believe this. But that's Korah. Korah is the type of the preacher, the pastor, the evangelist that tells you, oh, everything's okay. You're God's holy people. No matter what you do, you're still God's holy people. And these fundamentalist King James only people, we don't need them. In fact, they're holding us back from really doing great things from God. We need to get rid of them. And that's what Korah was up to. So you know what happened with Korah, right? Number 1632, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. God did that on purpose in front of everybody to let them know whose side God was on. In fact, guess who that pit was? That pit actually was somebody in the Bible. You know who it was? Mystery Babylon the Great. Look at Proverbs 23 verse 27. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. And notice, if you go back to that verse, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. Her mouth. It's talking about mystery, Babylon the Great. She was the one who was leading this rebellion of Korah against Moses. She was the one who was getting Balaam to keep naming his price for what he would be willing to be paid so he could prophesy. It was Mystery Babylon who opened her mouth to receive Abel's blood that she drank. And remember Babylon in Revelation 17, she drinks the blood of the martyrs of the saints because she gets drunk off of it. It's all about Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is the spirit now that is bringing all of the churches, all of the religions, and all the people of the world to gather them together to bring about the abomination that maketh desolation. It's her spirit that's bringing all of this about. 
Now, let's go back to Jude and look at something else that we find in there. Jude chapter 1 verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast, and we kind of covered that, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots, I'm going to talk about that, in your feasts of charity, and when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, we've talked about that, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, and then it says, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now that phrase, wandering stars, what does that refer to? Well, think, think of it like this. Think of the North Star. If you know where Polaris is, or even if you don't know where Polaris is, go outside at night, try to remember where the sun comes up and where the sun goes down and, and where you live. So that's east where the sun comes up. That's west where the sun goes down. Straight ahead north, there's a star there called the North Star or Polaris. And it's called that because it never moves. Every month of every year, the North Star stays in the exact same place year round. It is the one star, and I think God gave it to us this way so that we could learn how to navigate not just across the oceans, but across land. As long as you know where the North Star is, as long as you know that's where East and West is and so on, you can pretty much figure out where to go. Well, people have been navigating by the stars for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And what Star navigators know is that in the month of May at 12 p.m. on the on let's say on the 15th day of May at 12 p.m. if they look up there's going to be a certain line of stars that are going to be right overhead. Next year, May 15th, same time, 12 midnight, same stars are going to be there. Now, a month later, June 15th, 12 midnight, there's going to be some different stars that are in a straight line right above your head. And it's that way every month. And it's been going on that way now for 6,000 years. That the stars have courses that they follow. And it, whatever day you pick... At a certain time, these certain stars are going to be in these positions the same day every year. They are what's called fixed stars. And that's how people have learned to navigate by the stars. Then they noticed that there were some what they called wandering stars. They know that, and I don't know much about them. I know Polaris is at the north. And I know that Orion, you can see in the wintertime, but you can't see him in the summertime. And I know the Big Dipper, you can see in the summertime, but you can't see the Big Dipper in the wintertime. That's about all I know. But those who studied the fixed stars and navigated by them also noted that there were stars that didn't follow those rules. They were in different places at the, you know, on May 15th and then May 15th again, a certain star might be in a different place and they were going, these are wandering stars. They don't follow the course of the rest of the stars. So the Greeks had a word for that. 
So when Jude said in verse 13, wandering stars, go to blueletterbible.org. I've known this for a while. But the meaning, the Greek word that he used here for wandering stars was the word planetes. And it's where we get the word planet. And see, now it makes sense. Because while all of these stars of heaven are however many millions of miles away, and they follow a, the same course around the earth day after day, month after month, year after year, the planets that are look like stars, they don't follow the same course because they're part of our solar system. They're revolving around our sun. And some of them, it takes longer than it does others. Mars has a longer year. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they all have longer years. Uh, Pluto and Mercury, they have shorter years because they have a shorter distance to go around the sun and so on. So they were called planetes, wandering stars. And which means you can't, if you were going to look at the spiritual implication of it, if you were going to follow the fixed stars, you'll always be on course. If you're going to follow the wandering stars, you're never going to make it. You'll always be lost. And that's the illustration that he's using. One of them is that these planetes stars, these wandering stars, are going to lead you astray every single time. So the comparison, if, if I were to make a comparison of the fixed stars like Orion and the Big Dipper versus the wandering stars, I would say that the fixed stars represent the King James Bible because it hasn't changed in over 400 years. The words are exactly the same. And even going beyond that, the words are almost identically the same because you have differences in the way English was spoken back before 1611. You had the Wycliffe Bible, Bishop's Bible, Tyndale's Bible, so on and so on and so on. But then you have the NIV, which New Testament came out in 73, the Old Testament came out in 78. So in 1978, you had the first full edition of the NIV. And then, between 1978 and 1984, they changed it. They completely rewrote the NIV. Got a new copyright on it. And then by the 90s, they did it again. They altered it again. And then by the 2000s, they did it again until finally, in 2011, they have a completely different NIV Bible than what came out in 1978. And it's because the Greek text that the NIV and the new Bibles are based on keep getting revised as well. Those are wandering stars. In other words, you can't count on them to be saying the same thing from version 27 to version 28. The Nesalalan Greek text is in its 28th revision. And, and I guarantee you they're working on the 29th revision and when it comes out then the publishing companies will have to retranslate all of their bibles again to fit with the 29th revision of the greek text so tell me which one is the wandering stars and which one are the fixed stars i believe the king james is the fixed stars amen that's what i believe now uh I use the word planet from the Greek. But did you know that word's in the Bible? That word planet in the Bible. 2 Kings 23. And it's related to the host of heaven. These gods 
that God told the Israelites, don't follow them. Don't worship them. Don't serve them. He said it. 2 Kings 23, 5. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal and to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. God said that the planets, because they look like stars from, you know, we're out at night, we look up. I can recognize Mars. I can recognize Venus. If I had, if I get out my wife's Nikon 900 camera, I can spot Jupiter and I can see the rings of Saturn with that. Okay. But they're part of the heavenly luminaries, the heavenly host. And God said, be careful. Don't worship them. Don't follow them. Don't serve them. They're going to lie to you every time. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure, the likeness of any male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. Sounds like Baphomet, doesn't it? Sure it does. Uh, verse 18, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground. And of course, Baphomet's got that creeping serpent thing coming up. The likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, which would include the planets, even all the host of heaven shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. God said, Concerning these wandering stars, don't follow them. Don't serve them. Don't read your astrology chart. Now, I happen to know I'm a Gemini. I was born in May. Big whoop. Because you know what I don't believe in for one second? I don't believe that the position of the constellation Gemini and where it is in the night sky or the day sky and whose house it's in or whether Venus is going to pass through Gemini or whatever. I don't believe that that has any effect in my life whatsoever. But other people do. When people practice astrology, they worship and serve the host of heaven. In other words, they pretty much do what the host of heaven has told them to do. They worship and they serve them. Now, let me show you something. Here's a picture of all of the planets. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to leave the Earth out of it. We're going to look at the planets from the perspective of Earth down here. I am geocentric, meaning that I do believe that everything in the universe that God created the focus of all of that is right here on planet Earth. I do believe the Earth is at the center of the universe. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't believe that the Earth revolves around the sun. I do. And I can show you why. It doesn't mean that um, I think the Earth is flat. Because I don't. The Bible doesn't say anything about it whatsoever. 
But I think everything that God teaches us in the Bible about the heavens is from the perspective of the earth. And have you noticed that all the planets except the one that we live on were named after false gods. Manley Hall said this, the tutelary gods were given planetary thrones, meaning that they're kings, dominion, authority. Think about it. When you see a beast with seven heads, and crowns on his heads. He's a king. The tutelary gods were given planetary thrones, the celestial bodies being named after the deities assigned to them. Pythagoras regarded the planets as magnificent deities worthy of adoration and respect of man. And I want you to notice Again, if we're, we're going to leave Earth out of it because we're looking at all of these planets now from the perspective of the Earth. And how many then do we have? Well, you have the Sun here. Then the first planet is Mercury. That's the name of a god. Venus, that's the name of a god. We skip Earth because that's where we're on. We're looking at these planets from the perspective of Earth, which is there's no God named Earth. The next one over is Mars. He's the God of War. Jupiter, supposedly the great God, Jove. Then you have Saturn, who is also a great God. You have Uranus, and you will never catch me ever saying it any other way. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Uranus and then Neptune. So watch this. Let's count these. We have the sun. So we have Mercury, one. Venus, two. Mars, three, because we're seeing it from the perspective of the earth. Jupiter, four. Saturn, five. Uranus, six. Neptune, seven. They dropped Pluto several years ago. He's not big and important enough to be a planet, okay? He's like a micro planet or something like that, but he's not a planet. So how many of them are there? Seven. So I want you to think about this, that we have the, these seven planetary bodies wandering stars that the false teachers and the false prophets this that's the spirits that control them these wandering stars these gods we also have seven days in a week and they're all also named after gods moon day sunday um thor's day named after thorn Woden's Day, Wednesday, named after Odin, Saturn's Day, named after Saturn, and so on. So everything in like bundles of seven, named after these gods, these wandering stars, these gods whose spirits will lead you astray every single time. Now remember, this is eventually going to lead mankind to the abomination that maketh, that causeth desolation or that brings about desolation. And when mankind gets ruled over by these seven gods, these seven kings, these seven spirits that Jude described as wandering stars, the planets, mankind is going to be so messed up in his head head that he will not know the difference between the real God, the real Jesus, and the fake Jesus. 
Now, look at Revelation chapter 1. I like this. Because when I caught on to this, it dawned on me that God in His Word actually described the layout of the solar system before science ever figured it out. John was the last book, or excuse me, Revelation was the last book of the Bible written. And notice what was said here. Revelation chapter 1 verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So, I want you to get this picture. You have seven candlesticks, and you have the Son of Man, Jesus, who is in the midst of them. That means he's in the center, and they're around him. Right? Following me? Verse 13, one in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So, get this picture now. When John sees Jesus, he sees Jesus now because his face is shining like the sun. Jesus is the sun. And what is surrounding Jesus? The seven stars or the seven planets with the sun in the middle and the seven planets revolving around. I mean, think of, what, think of what an atom looks like. From the smallest thing that we can think of to the largest thing that we can think of, the whole universe is built the same way. You have an atom, you have a nucleus there in the atom, you have the, uh, the neutrons and the, and the protons, and then spinning around the nucleus of the atom are the electrons. And sometimes there's one electron, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's eight or seven. Just like in every star system or the solar system where you have a star, you're going to have planets circling around it just like you do with every atom. And even the planets, like our planet Earth, do we have something that rotates around our Earth? Yes, yeah, the moon. Are there moons that rotate around Mars? Yes. Are there ones that rotate around Jupiter? Yes. The ones that rotate around Saturn? Yes. They're all built the same. And Jesus is telling us that all of those are a picture of Christ because he's the son of righteousness and he's always in the midst. What did he say? Where two or more get two or more get, of you are gathered together in my name, there am I where? On the outside of you? Above you? Below you? No. I'm in the midst of you. Isn't that cool? Now, Revelation 1. He said, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So we have Jesus, who is the sun, and he is surrounded by the seven planets, which are represented by the seven candlesticks. From our perspective here on earth, that is exactly what the solar system looks like to us. So think about this. The number seven, what does it have to do with perfection and completion? The phrase word of God is mentioned 49 times in the King James Bible, which is seven times seven. The Ten Commandments are printed for us for the very first time 
in Exodus 20, which is the 70th chapter of the Bible. In the 490th chapter of the Bible, which is 70 times 7, that's Psalm 12, where it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And in the seven candlesticks that was in the tabernacle, remember there are 66 decorations of the almond tree showing us the 66 books of God's Word that is the light of the church. So Jesus and the Word of God are the Son of Righteousness and He is in the midst of us, His churches, who have in us the seven spirits of God. That is so beautiful to me. But what did he say about the false teachers and the false prophets? That they're full of wandering stars. Stars that will always, if you want to think of them as spirits, think of them as spirits but they're always going to lead people astray and keep them lost. Did you know, take a look at this. Did you know that's the Kaaba in Mecca? And did you know that it's required as a Muslim that you have to go to Mecca and walk. Mecca is, and the Kaaba is an idol. It's their God. And they have to walk around it seven times. And Manley Hall said that what they're doing is acting out the mystery in that the seven planets circling the sun year after year after year. The Islamic people are practicing the occult version of what God says we are. We are the seven candlesticks. We are the seven shining stars. And Jesus is the son of righteousness who is always in the midst of his people. In the Indian Hindu religion, remember they have what's called kundalini, the 33 bones of the spinal cord eventually reaching and tapping into the pineal gland, which can either put you to sleep or cause you to wake up. And a beast has to rise up, a serpent has to rise up through what? The seven chakras, which are seven swirling energy vortexes. Basically, there's seven spirits. See, this this is the opposite of the seven spirits of God. You can either be saved, believe the Bible, and be the recipient of the seven spirits of God simply because you believe the Bible, Or you can do all these hard, difficult. Don't ask me to yoga stretch. My legs and my back just won't take it. Can't do it. But they say that's the only way to God. It's through the body. But our God says, leave your flesh out of it. I want nothing to do with it. See what I'm getting at? These seven chakras are those seven planets, those wandering stars, those spirits that are leading everybody to a lost place where eventually they will lead mankind to the discovery of the the abomination of desolation. The Kabbalah, tree of life, basically the same thing. 
you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels with 10 circles in it and 22 paths, which makes 32. And then there's a hidden circle. That's number 33. That's the Antichrist. That's the beast. That's where he's hiding out. And it basically, the Kabbalah shows you the 10 divine beings, which are the 10 toes, the Iron Kingdom, mingling themselves with the 22 letters, the 22 amino acids of man's DNA, joining together. And I'm pretty sure that when that takes place, the abomination of desolation is going to take place on that day. In fact, that's kind of my theory. That the abomination of des desolation is not that Antiochus of Epiphanes poured pig's blood into the most holy place back in A.D. whatever or B.C. whatever. I couldn't care less that he did that. I think the real abomination that maketh desolate is the day that the Antichrist as God sits in the temple of God, the human body, showing himself that he is God. Revelation 17, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. See, these seven planets, these seven gods, represented by the seven days, or the seven gateways that someone must go through, or the seven rungs of the Masonic ladder that one must climb in order to get to heaven. These seven kings are seven gods. Deuteronomy 7, When that Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. I believe he was talking about seven spirit nations. The nations of the gods. That once they come to this earth and God says later on, don't let your son marry their daughter and don't let their daughter marry your son. Well, that's going to happen anyway. You know why? Because God said, don't do it. And when man does it and brings those two kingdoms together, that's when I think you're going to have your abomination that causeth desolation. Manley Hall said, The occultists of the ancient world had a most remarkable understanding of the principle of evolution. They recognized all life as being in various stages of becoming. They believed that human creatures are in the process of becoming planets. Did you see that? They're in the process of becoming gods. The wandering stars that Jude warned about that the false teachers would basically represent and that that's the spirit that's in them. Rather than having the, the seven spirits of God in them, they have these seven evil spirits guiding them and leading them in their teaching to bring everybody to a point to where they believe that they will become the planets, like the Muslims walk, walking around seven times because it represents the seven planets revolving around the sun. That's the spirit. So Jude mentioned that, that they would be like natural brute beast. He said that they would be like wandering stars. And then he said in verse 12, these are spots 
in your feast of charity when they feast with you. Peter said the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, And they shall receive their reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are, and blemishes. Now, we know that in the Old Testament law, that if you had a sacrifice to bring in, if it had any kind of spot on it, if it had any kind of blemish on it, it was to be rejected as an impure sacrifice. They couldn't, couldn't, could not accept it. And which is why God told the priest, don't be drunk. Because if you're drunk and somebody brings in a spotted animal, of, whether it's sick or not, if it's got a spot of some kind on it, you're supposed to see it and say, this doesn't qualify. It has to be no spots on it whatsoever. And it just so happens that there is a religion that spots their people. It's the religion of a Hindu. And they place on people's foreheads a mark, which they call a spot, or the word for it is bendy, B-I-N-D-I. A bendy, which is a Hindu word, meaning point, drop, dot, or small particle, is a colored dot worn on the center of the forehead originally by Hindus and Jains from the Indian subcontinent. The word bindu dates back to the hymn of creation known as uh, Nasadiya Sakta in the Rig Veda. Bindu is considered the, the point at which creation begins and may become unity. It is also described as the sacred symbol of the cosmos in its unmanifested state. Here's what else the Wikipedia article says about the Bindu. The Ajna is symbolized by a sacred lotus with two petals and corresponds to the colors violet, indigo, or deep blue, though it is traditionally described as white. It is at this point that the two sides Nadi, Ida, Yoga, and Pingala are said to terminate and merge with the central channel, Shashumna, signifying the end of duality, the characteristic of being dual. In other words, light and dark, male and female. The seed syllable for this chakra is the syllable Om. And the presiding deity is Ardhanarashavara, pardon my Hindi, who is half male, half female, Shiva, and Shakti. Now, hold on a second. All of that rings a great big giant bell in my mind. Because in Revelation 9, we know that the description, there's my page is torn there. I have to be careful with Revelation 9. That the description of the locusts that come out of the bottomless pit to sting everybody, to cause them to live for five months, that what, what really stands out in their appearance is is that they have the hair as the hair of women and they have the faces of the faces of men. So the bendy, the dot or the spot on the forehead of all of those who practice Hinduism, Jainism, or those who just think that's a cute decoration that spot represents the God, Shiva, who is part Shiva and part Shakti. I mean, it's no wonder that in order to receive Shakti pot, which means this awakening that you are one with the universe and that you have, uh, you have released the beast that's in the bottom of your 
spine up the 33 bones to activate your pineal gland called Shakti Pot is where they touch you on the forehead, which is the same place that all these fake charismatic guys go around doing, slapping everybody, touching them on the forehead. They all fall back. Is that the Holy Spirit? No, it's the spirit of Shiva and Shakti together. The, the uniting of the male and the female together. See, that's going to be part of the abomination that maketh desolation. Did God say that it was an abomination for a man to wear that which pertaineth to a woman and vice versa? You bet he said that. And he meant it. So, this spot, Jude mentioned it, Peter mentioned it. He's telling us what to watch for. That because of the sin of mankind, the sin of mankind is going to increase so much and get so bad that God is going to release these evil spirits out. And they're going to mark everybody with this spirit of Shiva and Shakti together. And all of a sudden, a dot, a spot is going to show up on their forehead. Boom. Look at what Deuteronomy 32 said. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. You know, what's interesting to me is in Ezekiel 8 and 9, Ezekiel 8, God has Ezekiel seeing all the abominations that go on in the temple. And in Ezekiel 9, we have a guy with a writer's inkhorn, and God says to the right man with the writer's inkhorn, go around and put a mark on the forehead of those who sigh and cry for the abominations of Jerusalem. In other words, it's a good mark. Because they're crying because Jerusalem's turned bad. And so God sends the other guys out and he says, I want you to slaughter everybody that doesn't have that mark. We know in Revelation chapter 7 that God hold, has the angels hold back the four winds of the earth and hold back the judgments of God until the servants of God from the 12 tribes of Israel are sealed with the seal of God in their forehead, which I believe is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, the Bible says. So what is the mark of the beast? It's the opposite of God's indwelling spirit in you. And there's so many things I want to say right now about it, but I've just I promised I'm just not, I'm staying away from certain topics. But how are people going to receive the mark of the beast? They're going to receive it as a result of all of their unrepented sins, unconfessed sins, sins that they hid instead of letting God cover them. I got a call today from somebody who told me about some sins in their life. And I said, you know what? I like you. Do you know why I like you so much? He said, no. I said, because you're honest. There's nothing the Bible said he had to call me and tell me what his sins were. But he felt so awful, he just needed somebody to pray with him, and I did. And I guarantee you, that guy never, never, got, God is never going to let him receive a mark in his right hand or forehead. A spot is never going to show up on his forehead. Because he chose to give his sins over to God and let God handle it. That's the way God wants it. There's a lot of 
internet warriors out there that while they're researching conspiracy theories, they're also doing things on the internet that they know is wrong. And they can't stop and they don't want to stop. And you know what's going to happen to them? A mark is going to show up on their forehead. A spot. A dot. Mark it down. 1 Timothy 6.14 That thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. James 1, 27. Re pure religion. Pure religion is not knowing all the conspiracy theories. That's not pure religion. Pure religion is not doing hours of research on this, that, and the other. Pure religion is this. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is, to, is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. My question is, is that you? Are you unspotted from the world? Because I guarantee you the mark of the beast is not something that you've already figured out how they're going to deliver it. I, I guarantee you, you haven't figured it out. Guarantee you, you don't know. It'll come in such a way is that if you're not really saved, you're going to get it guarantee you if you really are born again and your love is this book God won't let you get it even if you don't know what it is God's not going to let you get it I promise you I promise you keep yourself unspotted from the world people you won't have to worry about when the abomination that maketh desolation comes. You won't have to worry about it. All right? God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Keep praying for our work and our ministry in Kenya. We appreciate your support of that work. Please do what the Lord directs you to do concerning that work. Because I love those people. I love those people. And I want to see that they have their bellies full at night. So then we can preach the gospel to them. And they know that we're for real. And we're not trying to just get something from them. We're here to give. The love of Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.